So we had a lot of questions last week in class, and so we're going to make a video on this lesson because it's so long. And please don't take it wrong that I'm saying, please don't ask questions in my classroom and let me teach. No, you have great questions. The only problem is that I have so much I have to teach trying to get through fifth and sixth grade science all in, you know, one year's period that I, there are some lessons I have to make sure we get through. So I'm going to take the class period time that it should take to make this video so you can watch it. And if we you run out of time watching it here at school, you watch it at home also because I'm going to have it on Canvas. I'm also going to put it on my web page and so you have access to it. And also, if you don't even know where my school web page is through the school website, then most of you are able to get on YouTube. And if you look up Trace, T-R-E-S, Space Parker, B-A-R-K-E-R, easy to remember because that's my name, then you'll be able to find the science video as well. But we weren't able to get through all of the second lesson. So just a quick look at what we're talking about. I don't need you to fill this out. It's fine, but I want you to understand what it is that you need to walk away from this with. Because there's a lot of times that you're going to have to understand this on like your state standardized testings and things. But we have a population growth of rabbits. And we see that in the fourth year there's a giant jump in that population. And that would answer the first two questions. What year was the biggest increase? Well, there in the fourth year, it was about 840 because it wasn't quite to 850, the halfway point. But here's what I want you to understand. If there's more rabbits one year, then you're going to see a growth population of whatever the predator is the following year. Because in that one year, they're little itty bitty babies, right? And then they're gonna grow. Well, once they're out in the environment, then the predators have more food. And when they have more food, according to nature and how nature works, then they end up having more babies within that year's time. So it's actually a cause and effect, kind of like we talk about in our reading classes, a cause and effect scenario. When there's a low food supply, then as I follow in the following year, then the predator's uh, going to be low in population. And when the predator's low in population, then I have an increase in the prey's population. And so as it increases each year, it's going to increase. And so as this gets really high, then I know I'm going to have a whole bunch of foxes that are going to be born, and then they're going to need food. The more food supply in the prey category, the more predators that are born, so they eat more food. And when there's more predators that eat more food, then that population drops. And when that population drops, then the foxes are either going to immigrate with an E out, or they're going to die off because there's not enough food. And therefore, they're going to lower, and we're going to see the population of the rabbits eventually start to go back up. And it's a constant cause and effect that when there's more food, there's going to be more prey the following year because there's more food to eat, and then they're going to eat too much food, and the population of the prey is going to go down, and it's just going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, which is what I say there. Once again, if you want, just pause it and fill out your book. You can. It says, since all organisms affect each other, the fox populations would go up once there was more food. When the food su supply goes down, so would the fox population. But I'm not going to check your book for this question here to make sure it's filled out. So you're good to go if you just want to skip forward. And then we talk about the idea of population density. And population density is a math problem, and that's why it looks this way. It's a math problem because it's a fraction, and a fraction always means what mathematically? Hopefully all 73 of you thought, well, it means division, and you've learned that this year. Well, I put the number of individuals that I have in a particular area divided by the amount of area. So when I look at an example here of a ladybug, this will be a very small population because I have one ladybug over a field of plants. And that's, you know, no problem there. I can fit in with that. But then when I get a few more, then my population density begins to drop down, right? Because I have more in the same amount of area. Where the population density starts to feel crunched is when I go to count them and I've got so many to count. And just think, there are ecologists that this is their job. They count how many ladybugs are on a given plant. That would drive me absolutely insane. But people enjoy doing that. But population density is the number of organisms, the number of the individuals of that organism in a particular area, a particular space. Well, why do we talk about that? Because we have to understand that there are limiting factors. And this was going to be the end of lesson two going into lesson three. 
are limiting factors is what's going to limit a population growth. Right now, as human beings being the top of the food chain, we don't have a lot that limits our population growth. But other organisms do. And one of the things that's going to limit is climate. And that's what you see in your book there at the end. And if you want to go to your book on page 15, feel free and follow along, and that's fine. But when we talk about things like tornadoes, so in reading, if you haven't gotten to Greensburg going green, which is one of your stories, I think it's the fifth story in uh, Unit 5 of our book, it talks about a level F5 tornado that wiped out an entire town. There were only a couple things left standing, and so they changed over to being a green supply. But what they're saying is this entire area was wiped away, and the town had to decide, do they move? which is the emigrate with an E, right? They move away from. Or do they rebuild? And they had to figure that out. Well, wildlife doesn't have that opportunity. If a tornado comes through and wipes out an entire forest, all those organisms either die from the tornado or they've lost their habitat and they have to move. So climate definitely changes my uh, population and how much I can live. Floods will do the same thing. People lose their homes animals and organisms lose their home. There's a lot of flooding in this area right now because of all the rain we've had the past week and the water doesn't have anywhere to go. And if it continues to flood, then animals are going to have problems. In 2005 in Southern Africa, this is an actual picture. This is not a movie creation. This actually took place. And you can see here, these are all boats because all of the water that should be up here on the beach and in, in with the tide has gone out and forced itself into this giant tsunami and people's homes and areas and the environment was wiped away there were very few things left after this and they had to rebuild this entire area but people were lost their lives and there are a lot of different organisms that lost their lives simply from a climate change and the climate change happened from an earthquake a natural disaster hurricanes are like massive gigantic bigger than life tornadoes but with water so instead of dirt flipping around and flying and knocking things over, we got wind and water that just devastates an area along a coastline. So climate is going to limit how much our population can, can hold. Then when we talk, start thinking about outside of climate, what affects us, there are a couple of basic things. If I don't have food, I'm going to be limited. If we suddenly ran out of food in the world, our populations as human beings would begin to go down or we'd find a new food source. This is from a movie called Mickey and the Beanstalk and basically when they empty out their food jar, they have one bean that they have to share and a half a loaf of bread that it becomes transparent because they're kind of trying to slice it. But they're starving and there are organisms out in our environments that starve when there's something happens and it interrupts the food chain and food web. If you think what I said about last week with the ocean, if I remove the algae from the ocean, I have starved everything else because that's the beginning level of the food webs and food chains in the ocean and everything else is not going to be able to survive without it. So I would completely destroy by a lack of one food. And the other object is water. We can go longer without food, but we can only go three days without water. And if we don't have water, we're going to end up be, not being able to survive. And when droughts happen, other organisms are the same way. They have to have water. So it's a major limiting factor. But space is a huge one. We can adapt so well as human beings, but other organisms can't. And when there's too many, they either have to leave or they begin to die off. This is an actual beach um, over in um, Japan. I can't imagine going to a beach like that. I, I would just kind of freak out. And then having my kids there, I would really just kind of lose my mind. But that's an actual picture in the same way that this is in Thailand. The trains are the major source of transportation and people climb on and hold on in any location that they can with a handle and go from one point to another. And in major cities in China, this is their classroom. They have one teacher with a big speaker and a projector and they sit in these desks row after row, hundreds of students in one classroom because they're so overpopulated in their schools. I couldn't imagine trying to learn that way. But population is a huge limiting factor for us. That takes us into chapter one, lesson three. And in chapter one, lesson three, then we talk about how we interact with other organisms in our environment. And there's several different ways that we interact, how we relate with one another. 
This says when an organism survives an environment better than others, it often reproduces the species and it succeeds. So that comes directly out of your book. That's the definition for natural selection. You know, natural selection just means the top of the food chain usually survives and reproduces. And it's the other things that are being eaten that don't always survive. And human beings are the top of the food chain. And that's why many of our in our countries in our world the population continues to boom and explode because we are able to continue to survive and adapt to the places around us but animals work the same way the higher the the organism able to think and adapt and its ability to, to survive the greater its success the more it reproduces and it's usually the prey or the smaller creatures that don't survive because they don't adapt they don't have those adaptations to adapt for example if we're talking about an ice area, if you're starving and you need something to eat, you're quickly going to see the brown rabbit. It does not adapt to snow well. It can be seen. It stands out. If I'm just the opposite, though, and I go into a grass area, the brown rabbit would be down in the grass and blend in. But that white rabbit, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Larry Batts, when he brings his albino boa, he always says, that this creature could not survive in the wilderness. Boas like to camouflage themselves and they blend in with trees and stuff. You could walk underneath one and never know it was there. But an albino one sticks out and predators are like hawks and eagles are going to grab it and they're going to eat it. So adaptations let organisms survive in their particular part of the world and be successful. When we look at two major ways that organisms interact, we interact, we have competition and we have predation. In competition, there are organisms that they just adapt, and that means they just choose a different way of doing things. In this example, we have this tree, and we have three different birds that they eat from this tree, the bugs and the things are in it, but they only eat from particular areas of the tree. This Cape May will only eat up here in the top of the tree. It doesn't go to the middle or down at the bottom. And the bay-breasted warbler, it only eats the insects and the things in the middle of the tree. Where the yellow rump warbler, it only eats at the bottom of the tree. They have adapted to their competition issues. We call that a niche also. When a, a niche means that I have a particular way in which I fit in. These birds will only eat from certain parts of this tree because that's how they're able to survive and not have to get in fights with the neighbors. If I get in fights with the neighbors, one might win and I might lose and I might not be able to stay alive. So we have a niche. And some people say niche or whatever, but it's the word is niche. That's the role that they play in their particular habitat. We have birds that live and eat in the top of the tree and that's it. And we have birds that eat and, eat and live in the bottom of the tree and that's it that's their niche that's how they're comfortable that's where they can survive and not have to worry about a competition for food so when we talk about predation then there are two roles and you guys know this from fourth grade because we've talked about it a couple different times but i have a predator and i have a prey i have something that's going to be hunting and i have something that's going to be hunted we are the major number one predator in the entire world sadly we over predate because we have people that go and they kill animals just for the fun of it. They don't use the organisms that they're killing for their meat and things. They use them for trophies. Well, the idea of the organisms in the environment is that predation is to survive. They are the hunter, the fox and the rabbit, the bobcat and the other rabbit. Those would be the two rabbits that are in our environment. An owl and a mouse. It's designed in order to hunt and grasp on with its talons. It has a beak to tear it apart in order to eat and survive. There are predators versus prey out in the ocean as well. The shark being the number one predator in the entire ocean. It will hunt and devour anything that it can. It usually doesn't hunt something that's larger than it, but something that it can get a hold of. And jellyfish would be the predator. It's uh, tentacles that have those stinging devices, those stinging cells, and they grab a fish and they stun it, and then they pull it up inside of it, inside of here where it begins to eat it and dissolve it. Predator versus prey. Well, how does a prey protect itself then? And we do have some adaptations for the prey, 
that they have learned to protect themselves. One that is commonly seen throughout the um, living organisms species is the false eye. If an organism see it, sees it and it has a large eye, like the back end of all of these fish, they're more unlikely to attack it. The other thing that it does for it is you may see fish uh, that have been harmed and pieces of their tail have just been chomped off because most predators will attack in the back of a head in order to uh, get their food. And when I talk about these fish, if I bite the tail, it can swim away and it's still going to be safe compared to the head. And if you notice where their eye is, their eye is camouflaged in that stripe, so you can't really tell that this is a false eye. And since fish are not the smartest creatures in the world, they don't worry about it. They just try to go after the head, and then that fish is safe. But if I would compare that owl or that uh, moth to the eyes of the owl, they're very similar. And they, there's the sheen on their feathers are reflective of light. So sometimes insects or, or birds or predators will look at it and think, well, that's an owl, and I know to stay away. It looks like it has a big face, even though it's just markings. And there are a lot of insects that have adapted and have these false eyes on them that protect them and keep predators from hunting them down. This is the back end of a frog. It looks like it has giant eyes. And once again, the bigger the eyes, the scarier the creature would be. And so predators won't usually go after it. If you saw this sitting on water on a lily pad at night, you would think that was an alligator because those black dots reflect light in the same way that alligator eyes reflect lights. So this is not hunted very often by a predator. And this giant head caterpillar, it's not a giant head at all. It is a caterpillar whose markings on, on its rear end, its head is up here. And this thing begins to swell and hump over when it feels intimidated. And it looks like the head of a snake that also lives in that area. So that's its way of having a false eye to protect itself so it won't be hunted. That takes us to mimicking. Organisms will mimic something else that is dangerous to be protected. So we have two different snakes here. One is deadly poisonous, the other one, it hurts because it has teeth, but it's not going to hurt you outside of that. It doesn't have any poison in it. So when, the saying that I always taught my um, Boy Scouts when I was a scout leader was, red and yellow will kill a fellow, but red and black is a friend to Jack. And what that says is these markings, even though they're the same color, most animals are colorblind. So if you would put that in gray scale, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference between the two, but because our eyes are adapted for color, then I know that red and yellow touching, that is a coral snake that would kill me. Red and black is a friend of Jack. It'll bite me. It'll hurt because it has teeth, but it's not going to kill me because there's no poison inside of that. That's just a corn snake. These little things were everywhere outside at the north door and at recess last year. Or maybe it was, I think it was the beginning of this school year. Um, they're called sweat bees, but they're not bees at all. These are actually corn flies. And they are indeed a fly. There's no stinger on these things. They cannot hurt you. But they look like a bee. Why do they look like a bee? Because there are things that can be killed by bees, and they don't mess with them. They just let them uh, leave them alone so they don't get hunted down. The mimic octopus is one of the most adaptable organisms that there is. He is a major trickster. He is able to design his body like three different deadly organisms out in the ocean. The sole fish is a flat fish that lays on the bottom. And if you would step on that, most of us would end up in, the, in a grave because it will kill us. But if it doesn't kill us, it's going to make us deadly sick. Once again, if you go in the ocean, I strongly always to advise um, ocean shoes because that rubber, it won't hurt you. A lionfish is also very aggressive and deadly, and there's, there's prongs at the end of it that will hurt you. And it flares out its body in order to mimic a lionfish. Back to the soulfish, it flattens it out and it be, moves and swims in the same way a soulfish does. And this is a sea snake, which is very deadly. It's kind of like the eel. It hides in rocks and things, but it has teeth that will hold on to it like a regular snake, and it will eat its prey. And it flattens out its body and extends its arms to look like a sea snake. 
A mimic octopus is one of the most adaptive creatures there is in the ocean. And then we get into camouflage, and camouflage is exactly what we think it is, just like hunters that work here. Camouflage would go deer hunting, rabbit hunting, whatever they're looking for. They try to blend in. This is not just dead leaves on a tree. This is a gecko right here, even though it looks just like the leaf. It is camouflaged, so it won't be eaten. And this is a creature. This is an orchid praying mantis. This would be the flower, but it looks exactly like the praying mantis, and, or exactly like the orchid. And when a fly or an insect comes along to get the nectar from the flower that it thinks it's on, it turns around, bites it, and eats it. And this is a frog that's on dead leaves. It camouflages itself in and then makes itself flat to look like a leaf so birds and owls and other snakes won't come along and eat it. And there are many different organisms that camouflage themselves in nature all around us. And a lot of times we don't, we don't uh, realize that they're there. In uh, the, the southern regions where poinsettias grow, they have butterflies that match the same color as a poinsettia. Or this owl that blends into the hole of the tree. Or this frog whose back swells up and pops out this green stuff and it looks like the moss that it's on. Or these really crazy looking creepy spiders that sit on top of the yellow flowers and you don't even realize that they're there. Camouflaging is a great way for preys to protect themselves. And then some things have just learned to grow adaptive protective equipment. Now we don't have these. These are from Africa. This is a pangolin. It is kind of like our armadillo. They are cousins one to another. And they have these overlapping fish scale shells where an armadillo has a shell that kind of like an accordion unfolds and folds back up and they roll up to protect themselves. But a porcupine is not something you ever want to mess with because those quills have barbs at the end. If you get stuck by it, the quill comes out of the porcupine and sticks in your skin. Not fun from what I've been told. A sea urchin has protective covering. If you get stunned by it, you're going to get really sick and it hurts for quite a long time. And then we know turtles, the reptile, it has a hard shell to protect itself. And most turtles, not all turtles, but most turtles and tortoises can withdraw their head and their legs inside of their shell. And then we also have another way of warning in our environment. But it's not for you and I. It's for the other organisms. They, a skunk lets another organism know, if you come after me, you're going to be in trouble. And if you've never smelled fresh skunk spray, like as soon as it's been set off, it's horrible. <clears throat> the black widow spider has a bright red marking that warns you, I'm deadly. Don't come near me. Or we have different poison dart frogs in the rainforest. And the brighter their color, they're just simply warning predators, if you try to eat me, you're going to get sick or you might even die. And then we have this octopus. It is one of the most deadly organisms in the world because of the toxin that's inside of it. And when it's getting upset and angry, it literally flashes. It moves the cells that makes these blue circles. And it looks like it's flashing blue as a warning. Stay away. And then we go back to the uh, coral snake. I know that red and yellow will kill a fellow. And that's a warning to us to simply stay away. This is a sea star that its bright blue and purple and red colors are a warning to the creatures under the sea that it is poison, it is toxic. There are organisms that eat starfish, but this one, they don't even come near because they don't want to get sick. So then the last topic when it comes to this lesson is the idea of symbiosis. And symbiosis is the relationship that we have with other organisms. Sometimes one is going to be helped, but other times something's going to get hurt. So there has to be at least one bit, one being benefited, if not both. And so our basic ones are mutualism, and the word mutual means together. Mutualism means they both are helped. We have the clownfish and the sea anemone. The sea anemone is protected by the clownfish because it chases off other fish that would eat the sea anemone. The clownfish then gets a protective coating from the sea anemone and it protects it from other things that 
are prey to it. So when another fish comes down to be a predator, it gets stung by the sea anemone. So they help each other. So it's a mutual relationship. When it comes to the deer and the bird, the deer is helped because the ticks are being eaten. The bird is helped because it's getting food. And they will eat the mites and the ticks off of the deer's body to help it. And then they get food from it. And then we have these creatures that sit with the sharks. And what they do, these are not parasites. They're just stuck and they swim to the shark. And then when the shark is eating, they get all the bits and pieces off the shark. They will even swim into the shark's mouth. And how that shark benefits, this gets food. But the shark benefits because all the little bits and scraps that it can't get. It can't take its fin to come up and pull something out of its teeth or get a toothpick like you and I do. If it loses its teeth, it cannot survive because that's how it hunts. And these creatures come in, they swim inside the shark's mouth and even into the gills also, and they will pull out bits and pieces of food that get stuck so that it doesn't cause an infection and hurt the shark. The alligator is the same way. Without its teeth, it cannot survive, and bits of meat and things will get stuck inside of those teeth. So these birds have adapted and made this relationship with the alligators. The alligator opens its mouth, and you and I would expect it to close it. No, it realizes that if its teeth get infected from stuff that's stuck in there, then it's going to lose its teeth and it's going to die. So it opens its mouth. The bird gets food by eating the scraps that are stuck inside, and the alligator is helped by having the scraps removed. And in the same way, then we have ants and aphids. These little green things are aphids, and they will kill plants. But they secrete what's called um, uh, honeydew, kind of like the melon. And the ants use the honeydew as a food supply. So ants will protect aphids from other creatures like the ladybugs. And they will kill the ladybugs because the ladybugs eat the aphids. The aphids get protection from the ants. And then the ants get food, the honeydew, from the aphids. It's a mutual relationship. Also in symbiosis, we have a relationship where one is helped and the other one is not it's not harmed, but it's not helped. That's called commensalism. So barnacles are often seen on older undersea creatures. When I have a sea turtle with barnacles on it, or I have a whale with barnacles on it, it doesn't hurt these creatures, but the barnacles get transportation, and as these the sea turtle and the whale swims around, they take them to other locations where they get food. So they're getting transportation and new fresh food supplies, as they hitch a ride. Once again, neither the whale or the turtle are bothered by them. I have birds out west with the saguaro cactus that they put their nests inside of them. Why? Well, there's plenty of snakes out there, and very few snakes or other predatory birds are going to go in up a cactus to get the eggs out of the nest. So the bird is helped with a protective habitat to put its eggs and its babies, and the cactus isn't harmed at all. It's not hurting the cacti. Turtles will often take rides on top of alligators. Alligators won't eat turtles unless it's a sharp, soft-shelled turtle, which most of them are not where the alligators are. So they get a ride, they don't have to swim as far, and the alligator doesn't care because it's swimming. And then we have the um, milkweed plant and the butterfly. The butterflies, the milkweed, if you've ever pulled milkweed, gives off this real sticky, nasty, stinky substance. Well, what the butterfly does is it digests it and puts it inside of its system. And you'll find out if you ever do a study on the monarch butterfly, it has very few predators that it's a prey for. Because that milkweed substance makes it poisonous and toxic to most organisms that would try to eat it. So it gets protected. It's caterpillar form and it's butterfly form. So symbiosis is that relationship where one is helped, right? So I have the uh, mutualism where they're both helped. I have commensalism where one is helped and one is not harmed. So what's that leave us? Parasitism. One is helped and one is definitely harmed. Sometimes that one is killed. So we often can think of different parasites. The, in the relationship, there's two words that you need to know. There's a host, the organism that provides the food supply. And there's a, per, or a parasite that gets 
the food from it. And generally, it's the blood that's inside of the organism. So this fish has this parasite that is stuck to it, and it has this mouth that suction cups to it, and it has these teeth that just make a hole inside that fish and begin to suck the blood out of it. In the same way that this is a water insect that attaches itself to the tongue of a fish, and it eats the tongue of the fish, and the fish doesn't have arms to pull it off, so there is nothing that it can do. And it sits there and eats the tongue of that fish. These things happen to be multiplying more and more and more. There are insects in the ocean like this. There are sea lice also that you can get on organisms. But this critter, critter will then, once it has eaten the tongue of the fish, it then has a place to sit. And it sits there and as the fish eats, it eats particles that are floating around in the fish's mouth. This is not a weird porcupine caterpillar. This is a caterpillar that a wasp has attached its eggs to. So right now they're in egg form and that when they hatch then, they directly go into having a food supply. That caterpillar does not survive to become a butterfly because those wasp larvas then eat and digest the caterpillar as its first food supply. Mosquitoes work the same way as this thing does. They land on an organism such as you and I or our dogs or our cats or so on and so forth and they stick in their long nose and they pull out the blood of the living organism. They also carry a disease and that disease is what leads to our heartworm. Basically what they do is they lay on one organism that has heartworm and they carry the eggs inside of their bodies and when they get blood from another organism they drop the eggs inside of that organism. And we talked about the heartworms and how that's where these, organ, these worms go when they begin to grow and they go into the heart and that's why we feed our animals medicines to get rid of heartworm and they pass them from their bodies. So that's the end of our lesson. It should have taken you two days to get through this video. It's about 32, 33 minutes long. So then, what I need you to do is go to the front of the classroom, get your assignment and work on it. Two days, plenty of time to get through the video and do the assignment so you shouldn't have homework tonight.